Well, good morning, church. Would you stand? We're going to sing a few songs. If you were here last week, you know we're in our series about heaven. And so we're going to sing a little bit about heaven. So I just encourage you to clap your hands. We're going to have a good time this morning. Come on. Turn my attention off what I see. There is a greater reality. This world around us won't last forever. In just a moment, we'll be together. We're crying. Is seated on the throne and to reigning forever. I know that heaven is my home, so I'm gonna praise you like I'm there right now. There right now, whoa! I'm gonna praise you like I'm there right now. There.
But we're going to do that this morning. We're going to worship like we're in heaven. There's going to be a day when there's no more suffering. And that's something to look forward to. Church, can I challenge you this morning to let thankfulness just rise in your heart. Let's begin to just thank the Lord for his goodness. Lord, you are worthy. Thank you that we get to breathe another breath that we can use to turn into praise to you. God, would you move in this service this morning? We surrender you to this morning. For the Lord is good, it is not 
worship you all my life i offer you simple melodies of sacrifice in open hands and open heart you're the only one i want your presence is my treasure my delight so
Jesus. Can we just close our eyes? I'm reminded every time I come into church, every time I gather corporately and in God's presence that we hold on to this world way too tightly. And we can't fully give God the honor and glory that he's due. As we hold on to the things of this world, they become idols, things that we place before God. And then they, in turn, get our worship, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. So in these moments, friends, I want to help for you. Let's just outstretch our, our hands in a posture of worship. And we sing that God is worthy of it all. And what that means is that he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. But he's worthy of our families. He's worthy of our jobs. He's worthy of our pain, of our insecurities. He's worthy of it all, everything. So God, in these moments, there's nothing we want to place before you. No idol that we would worship or anything that we would hold on to. We simply present our broken lives to you, God. And I thank you that, that when you see us offer our lives in a, in a way that is representative of surrender and of humility, God, you are pleased. So God, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all, God. Teach us to let go and to trust you. God, teach us to allow worship to truly be what our life represents when it comes to serving you and honoring you, God. Not just lip service, but a way of life, a way of living. God, you are worthy of it all. Malachi chapter 1 verse 11 says, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So Father God, day and night, all of heaven is worshiping you. We find our place to worship you, Father God, to give you praise, to join the courses of heaven, to offer up pure worship, to let our worship be a, a sweet-smelling fragrance in your presence, God. That's what we desire. So God, we're, we're choosing to let go this morning and to give you honor and worship in Jesus' name. Jesus name one more time let's sing this song for some just keep your eyes closed the simple words we're going to sing let it be worship Believe it as you sing it with all of your heart. Let's sing it. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Praise you, Jesus. Let's use our hands and just thank him for how great he is. He's worthy. Amen, amen. Sometimes when I come in, it's just like an exhale. We go through this week and we, we keep so much in. And then we come into the Lord's presence and we just let it go. We just exhale. And then we breathe him in. It's refreshing. So thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, I have some friends in the room. You're your first time guests. Thank you for being with us and choosing to worship with Sego, we believe that, that God directs all of our steps. So you're not here by accident. God has something for you, and I'm excited to receive it together. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a good morning. Find someone around you. Find uh, someone you don't know, and let's make a new friend this morning. Here we go.
All right, I hate to break up a good thing, but I'm going to have to break it up. This is great. Well, again, good to see everybody. I love all the community and just the connection that's taking place. Again, if you're brand new, love that you're with us, and uh, we hope that you made a friend in those two quick minutes. Uh, anyway, so, all right. Well, hey, right in front of you, if you are new, or maybe you have yet to do this, there's a Connect card. should be right in front of you. There's a little tray. Go ahead and grab that. That is one of our ways that we make just a quick connection with you and we're not going to inundate you with emails, but we do want to reach out to you and just say thanks for coming and invite you to uh, our Meet the Pastors gathering. This is going to happen in just a little bit. Um, but fill this out, and you can take it to the Connect Corner. Right back there, there's a big banner that, that says Connect. Uh, hop on back there, and there'll be someone there to greet you. And then on the flip side is a section for prayer. And so we all know that prayer works, and you need prayer, and I need prayer. So if you got something going on, or maybe you're praying for someone that has something going on, write it down. And every Monday, we have a, a group of uh, prayer warriors. I think it's a bunch of ladies, Deborah and, and her, her ladies. They get together, and they pray for you by name. And also our staff is covering these prayer, prayer requests as well. So write something down, take it to the Connect corner, and we will get connected with you. And back there you can find there's free mugs, seal mugs, there's Bibles, and, and all sorts of other things that, that you can grab if you need it. So don't miss that. Um, and then I mentioned Meet the Pastors. That is happening after second service. And so you are first service. I realize I'm asking you to stick around a long time. So if you can't do it today, sign up for it next week, and you can come to that second service and then be a part of Meet the Pastors. And it's just our quick way of introducing myself and my wife Hannah to you and share a little bit about Siegel, but also we want to know about you and kind of how you found us and a little bit about your story. So it's very relational. Uh, no pressure, not signing up for anything, but we do want to connect with you. So again, you can sign up for that on your Connect card online or simply just show up every second Sunday of the month. So it'd be great. Um, I got to highlight water baptism. That is coming up. And I got some good news for you, folks. We have over nine people. When I say over nine people, we have nine people signed up. If you've never seen water baptism at Seago Church, that is a great picture. It's happening right here. It's during, during the music portion. And it's a moment that you get to celebrate with your church family. Maybe no one from your family is going to show up, but your church family, we're going to show up. And we're going to cheer you on as you, as you take steps of obedience for Jesus. And it's a, it's a beautiful moment. Again, many of you bring the tissues, okay? Just bring the tissues because it's cool when you get to see people follow Jesus in obedience, and then you get to celebrate him. And, and for some, you're going to know their story. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, look what God has done. And again, it's such a special moment. So if you have yet to sign up, you can hop, on, hop online and you can sign up there. Or you can talk to one of, one of our staff members. And if you have questions at all, we want to answer those questions. But it's coming up next weekend. Next weekend. This is the splash zone. So if you want to get, get wet, come sit in the front. You're like, okay, I'm good. I got water baptized. Okay, we're good. Um, it's going to be fun, though, so don't miss out on that. And then lastly, we have an opportunity in May. So this is a FYI, put it on your calendar. Uh, you can see right there, May 18th, which, which is a Saturday. We're going to partner with Hope Alive. Hope Alive, some of you know Phyllis and Kurt in the back. Phyllis, just wave. Yes, Kurt's somewhere running around. Uh, but Phyllis, is, Phyllis and Kurt are an amazing part of Seagull Church, and they have a homeless ministry right downtown Salt Lake, and every Friday they gather and they are feeding and clothing homeless people. There's some pictures you can see there. Uh, that is Bob from Seagull. He is not homeless, just so you know. <laughs> I was like, wow, landed right on Bob. Praise God, Bob has a house. Um, but Bob was down there serving with, uh, with a, a team that, that was with us last week. And uh, again, you can see those pictures. But yeah, we, we want to partner with Hope Alive and uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you've never done a ministry outreach to, to the homeless, it's powerful. Because you get out of your comfort zone. You get out of your comfort, comfortable suburban daybreak neighborhood. Everything's cozy and feels good. And you get into someone else's environment. And you, you, you can sense the love of Jesus rise up within you. Because it's only Jesus, right? And so, again, through, through serving sandwiches or handing out articles of clothing, whatever it may be, um, you're going you're gonna to be used by, by Jesus in a, in a powerful way. So, again, put it in your calendar. That's why we are mentioning it so early. Saturday, May 18th, 8.30 to, to 12 p.m. We'll give out more information as you sign up. You'll get an email response back. And, uh, again, it's going to be an awesome time. I know for me, I'm probably going to have to skip a soccer game or two with my kids. 
That's just reality. With our schedules, the way, the way things work nowadays, you probably have something on that date that you're going to have to make a decision on. I encourage you, skip it. Skip it and show up to this event. You're not going to regret it. Bring your kids with you for them to see you model the love of Jesus. It's a game changer. They need to see that. And so I believe there is, is an age limit. I think we landed on 12. But if you have some mature kids that, are, that, that can hang, let's talk about it. Let's bring them. And it's going to be great exposure for them to see you in action. So you with me? It's going to be fun. It's going to be good. I'm excited for it. All right. Well, we are going to transition into our time of giving. Um, this is our opportunity to be, to be faithful and generous. We can see on our core values, generosity is, is our action. We want to be generous. We want to be a generous church. And to be a generous church, we need generous people. I highlighted last week that we gave uh, $2,225 to Convoy of Hope uh, over our Easter offering. So thank you so much for being faithful and giving. They were, um, Convoy of Hope is, is uh, basically an organization that mobilizes people to feed those that are hungry. There's a variety of things that they do, but specifically we gave towards those that are being impacted by the war with Israel and Gaza. And so there's a, a um, starvation. It's, it's imminent. People are going to starve. And so food is being dropped in, and Convoy of Hope is a part of that. So thank you for being generous. Um, and that, that is something as I think about what's happening today. There is a, a war in Israel, and there's going to be more needs that are going to emerge as we kind of walk out the next few weeks and months. And I'm thankful that as a church, we can be ready. We, we're in the ready position to give and to, to act. And, and that is a blessing that, that you've, you've been a part of, but as a church, that we can say we can meet that need and step into that opportunity. It's tremendous. So thank you for being faithful with your tithe and your offering. Many different ways you can give. You can see up there on the screen. Uh, but we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for our offering, but I do want to pray for Israel and what's happening over there. And again, if, if you've watched the news over the past 24 hours, things have intensified. And uh, not just Israel, but many countries in the Middle East are going to be brought into this. And um, as I think about uh, the Middle East, they need Jesus. But also there's brothers and sisters in Lebanon, in Syria, Iraq, Iran. They need protection in Jesus' name. Uh, so it's Israel, yes, we're going to pray for Israel, but there's other countries that are affected. But um, this, is, this is impacting the world, and it's a part of biblical prophecy. And so uh, God is doing something, and we pray that he would uh, rest upon his country, upon his people, the Israelites, and uh, just bless them. So would you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity for us to be faithful with our, our stewardship. God, you've, you've blessed us. You've given us so much. So God, first and foremost, we say thank you. We honor you with our first fruits. God, we honor you with, with our giving, Lord, as, as a way of saying thank you and uh, just putting you in the center of our lives, Lord. And I pray right now as, as we thank you for our, our, what we have, how you've blessed us, Lord. We, we think of Israel. We think of the Jews we think of people all over the Middle East that are in great need of you, Jesus, whether they know you or not. Lord, I pray that, Jesus, you would be highlighted, that, Jesus, you would come in such a dramatic way in dreams, in visions, and in, in even provision that, that shows your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that you would be on the move in the Middle East. And, God, we do pray that your favor would continue to rest upon uh, Israel, that, God, you would let your hand rest upon them through protection and provision, and that, God, the world can see that, God, you are the God that they serve, and you are the God that they worship, and that, God, through that, Jesus would be made known. So, God, we thank you so much for uh, what we get to be a part of your church. God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, I pray a blessing upon it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. One of these days, they're going to be taking me out to the cemetery. They'll be saying some words over me. Is that the end? Is it all over? Here is the question. If a man dies... The moment you read in the paper that Billy Graham is dead, you'll know that he's more alive than he's ever been before. And I'm in heaven. 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 I know I'm going to heaven. I'm looking forward to it with great anticipation because of what Jesus did on that cross. He died for us, but he was raised by God. The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. Because he lives, we too are going to live someday in that same resurrection glory. 
And because of the hope we have in Jesus, we can all be in heaven someday forever. But first, there must be a decision here and now in this life. He's alive! I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? Do you? Do you? Good morning. So as you watched that, you felt some things. I know they've been showing it the past few weeks. And... Um, we're going to talk about how that video made you feel in just a second, because I know you felt something. But first, let me just give you a little uh, background of who I am. Most of you know who I am, because my family and I have been attending Seago for the past, I don't know, seven, eight months now, but we've been friends with Chris and Hannah for a few years, and um, we are incredibly honored to uh, be a part of the Seago family, because Whenever we walk in the doors here, what we experience is love and joy and life and excitement about those who are saying, yes, we have something that is sacred and beautiful, and it is a connection that stands on the hope that we have in Jesus. And that's something that is just immersive, isn't it? And as my wife and I, who were pastors in St. Louis for many years, met Chris and Hannah and listen to their dreams and, and listen to their calling and just learn from them as they were walking through even different challenges. Uh, the Lord used them in some pretty instrumental ways to bring us out here. And we're grateful for them. We're grateful to be here. And um, we are, uh, we, we feel home here. And that's, that's a, that in and of itself is a sacred feeling, right? So to that point, I don't know if you've, seen this video before if this is your first time here, but whenever you're, you're listening to someone like Billy Graham talk about heaven as though it's home, as though there's acceptance there, there's, there's something to look forward to, not all of us have that same response whenever we think about heaven. Some of us, whenever we think about heaven, are like, you know what, I kind of like my home here. It's kind of okay. Like, I love you, Jesus. Thank you. But I got some good things going on for me. And as a result of that, and a few other things we're going to talk about, we might not think about heaven as often as we could or should, which is the purpose of this sermon series. And Pastor Chris did an amazing job last week just kind of setting the table for us, just reminding us that when we think about heaven, that we have to, we have to kind of set aside these notions of streets of gold, which, okay, that's in the Bible and that's going to be there, and the mansions and all these other things. Just set that aside for a second and to understand that heaven isn't paradise because of the type of place it is. Heaven is heaven because of who's there. And it is the presence of God Almighty. See, he's the one who you were created for. And where, I love the illustration that he used. You know, home, uh, home is where the heart is, right? That's what you said. Well, that's true. So when my wife and kids aren't home, home is kind of lonely. But when they're there, when their presence is there, that's what makes it sweet. That's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it exciting. And that's what's going to make heaven exciting. And yet, and yet, Chris and I were on a walk the other night. And he goes, you know what? The interesting thing, he said, as I was preaching this sermon on heaven, I was you know, in, in myself, the spirit of God was just convicting me, saying, you need to think about eternity more. Sometimes we can get in our lane and we just focus on all the things we have to do, even well-meaning things, being a pastor, planning a church in Utah. But we can get so in that myopic place. I'm making YouTube videos and, and telling people about how, you know, my beliefs are compared to similar, different to other beliefs. And we can get so in our own strategies that, that the spirit of God can say, hey, don't forget the bigger picture here. We all need the, the reminder of the bigger picture. And I was kind of resonating with, with Chris as we were processing through that. But he also brought up another response that he heard from individuals. And I had people with me here last week, and they had a similar response. And it was this. It felt a little heavy. I felt a little sad. Now, there could be various reasons why that might be the response that we have. Um, one could just simply be because when we face our mortality, that can seem intimidating and overwhelming. How many people are super stoked about going to heaven? Raise your hand right now. Bring it up. Put it in the air. Let's go. How many people are really looking forward to dying? There go the hands. 
Okay? So when we, faint, when we have to face mortality, we have to cross that bridge, it's like, right? So that, it kind of makes sense. Um, maybe just the mystery of it all. Um, maybe you're, you're thinking about it less from dying from the standpoint of Jesus is going to come back. We're told that it's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult before it gets better. And in the news we're seeing today, it's getting pretty bad out there. That can be a little bit intimidating and scary. It's like, Lord, can we just, can we just bypass all that and just, you know? For some of us, it might be because you're, you're just having a hard time right now. I can relate to that. I had lunch with a brother this week, and we were just kind of talking about, like, man, sometimes life is tough. And I will tell you, for Joy and I, it's been rough the past six months, eight months since we've lived here. It's been rough. It's been good, but it's been rough. And, I, and, and when, you're, when you're dealing with any sort of pain, whether it's life pain, whether it's physical pain, you know, pain can kind of consume you and you become, you know, captive of the tyranny of the urgent of like, oh my gosh, how do we make this pain go? That can take away our joy about what comes next. So I think we can all relate to when we watch a video like that saying, I felt different things. And I'm just here to say, it's okay. The question is, how can we then arrive at a place when we, when we think about what comes next for us, that we can live in hopeful anticipation rather than uncertain apprehension? This is, this is the question that we want to apprehend this morning. And, and I'm going to focus specifically on what Pastor Chris said last week when he said, heaven isn't a place, it's a person. And I'm going to add another one to this, okay? Heaven isn't a place. It's a plan. Go with me. You know one of the ways that we can really feel left out and we can feel like, we can feel, we can feel, come on. When someone makes plans and you're not included, Some of you didn't laugh. That means you're feeling a little raw right now. Uh, the, a few years ago, my wife and I, we went to San Francisco, and I had this great idea. We had never been to California, and uh, it was for her 30th birthday, so it was like a year ago. And, um, and I, I had this great idea. It's like, I'm going to surprise her. Like, everything's going to be a surprise. So I give her this card, and I'm like, be ready to go to the airport tomorrow at, or it wasn't tomorrow. It was like next week at this amount of time pack things like this. She's like, okay, this is cool. This sounds exciting. So she did. We get to the airport. She didn't know until we got to the airport. We're going to San Francisco. She's like, okay, cool. And then we get on the plane and like, she's like, what now? I'm like, I'm not telling you. So I drive to Fisherman's Wharf. I'm like, ta-da, Pier 39. She's like, cool. And she's like, what's next? I'm like, I'm not telling you. So then I drive over to the full house house. I'm like, ta-da. She's like, cool. And then I took her to, um, Golden Gate Bridge and Mere Woods. And each time she's like, what's next? What next? I'm like, I'm not telling you. Finally, on this first day with this grand plan that I had, she's like, can you please just tell me what the plan is? Like, this is overwhelming me. Like, all the ta-da's and all the surprise, I'm not into it. So just tell me what's happening next. She's like, okay, I can get on board with that. Mm. But whenever, whenever we're not locked into plans, we don't have clarity on plans, whenever we feel left out of plans, we have a hard time finding our place. When we don't have a plan, we don't have a place. We don't have a plan, we lack meaning. We don't have a plan, we lack purpose. These are really important things to us. And I'm here to tell you this morning that when it comes to heaven, when it comes to what comes next for you, it is part of a plan. And it is not just a future plan. It is a plan that he's established before the foundations of the earth were set. He has a plan. And you, my friends, are part of it. This is where... We cross that gap of uncertain apprehension to hopeful anticipation. So what we're going to do is we're going to just gonna hit a couple things really quick this morning that might take down our misconceptions about heaven so that we can enter into heaven today. That's, that's my hope as you walk out of here. Okay? So the first thing is this. There's a misconception that we have about heaven just as it pertains to our involvement there. And when we anticipate going home, when we anticipate what's coming next... We, we lose sight of the fact sometimes that heaven is not our final form. 
And this comes from this thing that, you know, God bless Billy Graham, like, right? But he kind of shorthanded what our eternal destiny is, that he knows he's going to be in heaven. Now, I know that Billy went to Wheaton, and he has good theology, good old Baptist, right? He knows that that's shorthand for, oh, there's so much more than heaven. And when it comes to that final form, my friends, see, we've got this idea that we're just going to die and go and be with God forever. Can I tell you, that is not what the Bible teaches. And I get why we might arrive there. I mean, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we read this passage last week, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So this idea that when we die and we leave the body, we're going to go be with the Lord. And my friends, that is true. We do that. There's an intermediate state where we go for those of us who have a faith in God and we find our place in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus alludes to this whenever he's hanging on the cross and he's facing his own mortality. What does he say to the thief that's hanging next to him? He says, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. And we know what's about to happen. They're about to pass through mortality. And when he finally does breathe his last breath, what does Jesus say? He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So it makes sense Because it is true, it makes sense that when we leave this body, the idea of going to be with God and to be with him in heaven, that is true, but that isn't all. You see, this intermediate state where we live is actually a hopeful anticipation in of, of itself in God's presence because we know that that is not what we're meant to exist as forever. You see, you, my friends, are not just a spiritual being. We have this a little bit, it's it's kind of this uh, Platonian, this this Gnostic almost idea of our existence that our spirits are good and pure and that's what God wants and our bodies are bad. And that's just not true. Uh, We, you are a spirit and you are a body. You remove one from the other, something's missing. Which means then that in order for us to pass from this fallen world where we have a fallen spirit, we have a fallen body, we have broken spirits, broken body, he sends Jesus to take care of the broken spirit part. And then whenever we leave this earthly body and we go to be with him, we are awaiting a glorified body. Do you know that you will exist in eternity with a body? With a glorified body? This is what it's talked, what's talked about whenever we celebrate Easter, Right? Easter is not just the happy ending to Good Friday. Easter is the foretaste of what you got coming to you. Easter is Jesus rising up out of the grave in this glorified form. And what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, as Christ indeed has raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. The first fruits that is being talked about there is Jesus. He was the first one that looked death in the eye and said, nah. And he defeated death. He received a glorified form. And he was the first. And we are to follow. See, the scriptures teach, if you keep reading down in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, hang on, it's a lot of scripture, you're not allowed to fall asleep. I know when we read a lot of scripture, people want to, you know, don't do it, let's go. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is a law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. See, Jesus' resurrection promises us that beyond heaven is our own resurrection. 
And that's what we anticipate. Which leads us to another misconception about heaven. It's not just, heaven just isn't our final form. Heaven also isn't our final destination. God has a plan that takes us out of this disembodied bliss when we receive a resurrected body. And he is, and we're going to talk about this in just one second, he is going to bring about a new heavens and a new earth. And that is our final existence. Because here's a reality, my friends. One of the reasons why we have so many questions about heaven is because we're talking about this intermediate state when we're asking that question. We want to know what happens immediately next after we die. And I'm going to tell you that the Bible is not very clear. It speaks to it a little bit. And there's some indications we have that the moment after you cross from, from this life into the next, what that waiting state is going to be like. But most of the information we have about what eternity is going to be like is actually describing what happens after Jesus returns, we are resurrected, and here we go. Most of the descriptions we have have to do with the ongoing destination rather than the temporary destination where we will exist before he returns. And I really want you to hang on tight because we're going to do something cool. Because Jesus, like I said, he has a plan. This has always been his plan. And he was giving hints all along the way about this beautiful plan. In fact, whenever his disciples are trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between this world and the other world, and they're saying, Lord, how do we even pray? He's like, I'm going to tell you exactly how to pray. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now hear me, my friends. The beauty and the profoundness of that statement strikes at the very heart of what God has intended since the beginning of time. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what's being described there? It's the Garden of Eden. Now, you're not going to find a scholar that's going to say, Jesus is teaching on the Garden of Eden here. That's not my point. My point is that in the heart of God and in the mind of God and the plan of God, it is his desire that we understand that our ultimate destination, whenever and wherever it is, whether it's crossing from this life to the next or beyond, is that your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, so often we have, we have it a little bit reversed, and you're going to see this in a second. We think we die, and God's plan is that we go to be with him. No, God's plan is that he comes to us. That was his plan in Genesis. That was his plan throughout the Pentateuch. That was his desire with the temple, which we're going to see in just a minute. That was his desire in sending Jesus, Emmanuel, God. See, we have it reversed. We think it's all about going to him. He's like, you guys, no. I'm going to come to you. And that's how we're going to end this thing too. See, in Acts, whenever you see Jesus' ascension, he goes up into heaven and his disciples are standing there and they're staring at the sky and they're like, what just happened? We thought that he was about to just go up to Rome and kick butt and take names. Where did he go? So they're staring up the sky and as they're strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee... Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Y'all, we aren't waiting to go to him. We and the people that have already gone to him are waiting for him to come to us. See, he's got a plan. He's always had a plan. And we see the consummation of this plan in the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, or from the throne, saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 
He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And I've had a plan this entire time. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. See, Jesus promises us, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say because I'm going to define it now. He promises us that heaven isn't all. Even heaven isn't all. Because it's not our final destination. Let me add a little bit of clarity here in this final statement that I'm going to make. That heaven isn't just about the future, it's about the now. And let me, let me clarify that because this now gets into us intersecting with God's all-encompassing plan that he's always had. Where we're going and where we can live today. I want you to think about heaven and earth specifically as two dwelling places. Okay? Because the reality is... The book of Genesis starts with this. In the beginning, God created the and the. Very good. And we just read right here in Revelation 21, then I saw a new and a new boom. So here's the deal, guys. See, God is this transcendent being that is far beyond anything that we can comprehend. He exists outside of time and space. What does that mean? But he is not so distant that he is an unknowable. He is very knowable. In fact, he is not so distant that he is not relatable because he's very personal. And he loves us, which is why he became one of us. But when we think about heaven and earth, one of the best ways that we can kind of just connect all of this together is this. Think about heaven as what the Bible describes as where God dwells. And earth is the place where we dwell. And everything that we're seeing from Genesis all the way to Revelation is God's plan to say heaven and earth together. Where I dwell, where you dwell together. He created the heavens, basically demarcating this is where I dwell. And the earth, this is where I'm putting you, my image bearers, and you have dominion on this earth. And I will walk with you in the cool of the day. And then when they were cast out of the garden, there was suddenly this barrier. It's called sin. There's suddenly a barrier. It's called death. So what does he do? He sends his son to announce a new kingdom. How do they announce the kingdom? Between the father and the son, it is the kingdom of heaven. And so then it makes sense when his disciples are saying, how should we pray? He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because where I'm going, where you can't see me, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about this in just one second, and then I'm going to end. Is also just a down payment of my presence where we will dwell together. You see, the new heavens and the new earth, my friends, is a tangible, real place that we will live. He is going to, with a fire that we cannot even comprehend, refine this order and refine this existence, and the old order will pass away, and we are going to exist in a new heavens and new earth. And sometimes we're like, I don't understand how that works. Like, is it a new heavens or is it a new earth? Is like God still gonna be up in heaven? That's not the point. The whole point is that God's dwelling place will be with us because it will be a new heavens and a new earth. This is what we anticipate. This is what we have to look forward to. This is why, and I'm not going to read the passages, we can see this consistent plan that God had when he decided to establish a people for himself and he sends Moses up on Mount Sinai and he descends from the mountain and he's like, God wants me to build a place where he can dwell. So they build the tabernacle and the temple. Why? And then that being sort of a foretaste or sort of an appetizer, if you will, or an arrow pointing to the fact that he's going to send his son. And what does it say in Matthew chapter 1, 23? And you shall give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want you to just reframe your ideas about heaven that whatever chasm needs to be crossed in your mind and in your heart, whatever what might feel mysterious or uncertain, you don't have to get there. He's bringing it to you. And here's the deal, my friends. Let's land this. You've already tasted heaven.
if you're a follower of Jesus, you know what hell feels like. Because he has shown you what heaven feels like. By, and I use this in every sermon, so you're just going to have to take it, hovering over the surface of the deep of your life and saying, let there be. Taking what was formless and void and chaotic and saying, let there be. And you know what that let there be is? It's his presence. You've tasted it and you've been transformed by it. And this is how I want to encourage you, my friends. See, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul, as he's talking about the ministry that he had to the church in Corinth, as, as, as he's, he's describing the calling that, that's been placed on their life, this is what he says. See, so, so from now on, we regard no one from a world regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he was committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So, my friends, one of the best ways that we can sort of apprehend ideas about heaven is to stop thinking about heaven as just this future reality. It, it is our current reality. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have hope. If you are a follower of Jesus, you know what hell feels like because you've been transformed by the, re, by the regeneration of the Spirit of God. And now you walk in this broken world as a new creation. So you don't have to just live in anticipation. You can live in activation of the hope and the life and the peace. You have a message that says no more pain. You have a message that says no more crying. You have a message that says no more death. Which means, when we ask the question, how can I live in anticipation of the new creation? Be the new creation. H how to live in anticipation of that new heavens and the new earth? Live in that new heavens and that new earth today. See, that's where God's at work. That's where Jesus is at work. That's what he came to proclaim. I'd like everybody to close their eyes, bow their heads. As you're hearing this message, there still might be a lot of things that are running through your heart and running through your mind. Some of you might be thinking about the questions that you still have that you want answered. Some of you might be thinking about a loved one that you've lost. Some of you might be in here thinking about some serious questions about where you stand in that plan that God has. I'm here to tell you this morning that one of the beautiful things about any of those considerations is that Jesus isn't just standing in the heaven he's waiting for you to kind of figure it out. Don't forget he came to us and he's wanting to meet you right where you are. We may not get all of our questions answered. We may not get the insight that we desire when it comes to maybe loved ones that we've already lost. But he can and he will and he does comfort us with just the reminder that says, I have a plan, I always have. You're a part of it, trust me. Focus on the hope and the peace and the joy 
that I've offered you, that I've given to you. And if there's anybody here this morning that, that you, you can honestly say, I don't, I don't know what that tastes like. I, I, I don't know what this means. I have good news for you. You don't, you don't have to wait any longer. If you're here this morning and you feel like you're on the outside of this amazingly wonderful, invigorating plan that God has, it's quite simple. You confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You cry out to him this day and you say, Lord, I hear your voice beckoning me, inviting me into this plan of hope, but I'm sinful and I'm lost and I cannot enter that plan without you doing something about my sin. I trust that Jesus was sent to take care of my sin and my lostness. And I receive through my repentance and through the forgiveness that you are offering me, the hope that you give us through your son. I wanna follow you for the rest of my days as I not only live in hopeful anticipation, but experience that hope today. Lord, for every soul that's in this room, you know what they need to hear in order to walk out of this place knowing that you are a God that has a plan, a God that is full of hope and joy and goodness. And Lord, I just pray that in our sphere of influence and the lives that we are living, that you would show each of us how we can live out this new creation reality as we anticipate the new creation. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your hope. We thank you for your plan and that you've invited us into it. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jeff. Great job. We're going to stand up together. Would you stand with me? And as we just let the reality of heaven being here right now, as we, as we grasp that and, and get it in our hearts, let's leave with a smile on our face, excited about the possibility of heaven and, and where God has us, but also knowing that we get to share heaven with those all around us. So as you leave here for lunch or wherever you're going to go, the parks or the hikes, whatever it may be today, uh, take, take heaven with you and share Jesus in his great love. Amen? Amen. So we have this little booklet we're going to hand out. Uh, Natalie has it over there. So as you walk out, if you would like this booklet, I mentioned Randy Alcorn last week, but he has a probably, I think, maybe about 60 questions that are, that are common questions about heaven. You can grab this and just digest it and get scripture in you. Um, for some, as Jeff was sharing, like if, if you're just, oh, like a little anxious or even confused about heaven, dig in, get the knowledge, get the understanding that God has for you, and let that bring comfort and excitement for your future. So we have our prayer team members. They're going to find their spots on either side of the room. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to lift you up and pray for you. Maybe there's something about today that was shared they're like, man, I, I, I'm wrestling with that. Like, I, I, I want to bring that to the Lord. I don't want to leave with anxiousness or fear, but I want peace and comfort. Um, again, if anything at all, go to our prayer team members, and they will pray for you today. But we love you so much. We're cheering you on. Have a great week serving the Lord. Be blessed.